it was just a surreal feeling. I just never thought I could sell a coffee blog, you know, in the seven figure range. Um, so it, it, you know, I was <laughs> overwhelmed by gratitude um, for the journey and everything that happened. And also very excited just to know that um, the hard work paid off basically. Hey, what's up, you guys? My name is Mikkel Kraszowski, and welcome to episode 98 of That Remote Life Podcast, where we hear from location-independent entrepreneurs and professionals so you can learn to quit the cubicle and live life on your terms. Now, today on the podcast, I'm joined by Alex Azuri. I was first introduced to Alex inside of the DC community, which is uh, hosted by the folks over at the Tropical MBA, and Alex shared a thread in that community titled, Personal Blogging, A Waste of Time? Question <laughs> mark. And in this thread, Alex shared that he had recently sold his coffee blog, which he had been running for the last five years, and he had sold it for a low seven-figure amount and was now looking for a new project to focus his attention on and to help him figure out what's next. And he was considering starting a personal blog to sort of explore this new side of his life and wanted to know if this would be a waste of time or not. Now, obviously, this thread really sparked my interest And I decided to reach out to Alex and see if he'd be interested in coming on the podcast to talk about his journey. Um, And I really wanted to find out, first of all, how did he build a seven-figure coffee blog? That's not an easy thing to do. What made him want to sell the, the business and what the process of selling the blog was like. So Alex agreed to come on and I was super excited to talk to him. And during the interview, we discussed all of that and much more like how Alex managed his, his transition from working in construction to then becoming an online business owner, why networking was so important for him when he was building the business and what are the questions that you should be asking yourself as somebody starting a business or running a business that have really helped Alex in his journey. But before we jump into the episode, I do want to let you guys know about my new newsletter, Nomad Insider, which comes out every single Monday morning and covers everything you need to know as a global citizen and online entrepreneur. I review all the news of the week and share only the stuff that's relevant to your life, like updates about remote visas, technology, co-working, new nomad destinations, crypto, and much, much more. Basically, imagine this newsletter as the most important things you need to know as a digital nomad or location-dependent entrepreneur summarized in one short and fun-to-read email. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, if you are a lifestyle business owner or a digital nomad, head over to thatremotelife.com forward slash nomad insider. That's nomad insider, all one word, and you can join over there for free. As always, if you are enjoying this podcast, head over to ratethispodcast.com forward slash TRL to leave a review. That's it. It's super easy. Just head on over to that URL, ratethispodcast.com forward slash TRL, and you can leave a review. It's very simple. It's a really cool service if you guys want to check it out if you have podcasts as well, Uh, but it makes reviewing this podcast really, really easy, which has been super hard in the past. Also, you can find all the show notes and resources that we mentioned during this interview, along with the video version Uh, of this interview. If you guys didn't know, this podcast isn't only published uh, in podcast form. You can also watch the interviews uh, in video over on YouTube, but you can find all of that with a link to the YouTube video at thatremotelife.com forward slash episode 98. That's episode all spelled out, followed by the number 98. But all right, you guys, uh, without further ado, let's dive into this awesome interview with Alex Azuri. All right, Alex, welcome to the show, man. How are you doing? Thanks, Mika. I'm good. How about you? I'm good. We were just talking that uh, you're enjoying the nice weather over there in Australia while the rest of us are uh, freezing your asses off, so that's nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you know, Australia is a warm country. I'm on the East Coast. Um, you know, I didn't mention the fact that we also just had a, a cyclone, so don't be too oh, jealous. Oh, really? Yeah. Did, uh, like, did, did anything happen from that? Because uh, cyclones are essentially the opposite of hurricanes, right? Like they spin the other way. Is that right? 
don't think I, I, I don't really know that answer. That, question, that might but. be one of those bullshit science things that you read on the internet, but I've always thought that cyclones are in the Pacific, but do, I, so I feel like there's yeah, something about these. I don't know. It's a good question. I'm going to go look it up, but, but <laughs> nothing crazy. It was just, just some terrible weather, lots of rain. Um, we, uh, it's a pretty dry area we live in mm-hmm. as well. So it was nice to get a lot of rain. Um, and also it brings a lot of swell. I like to surf. So Ooh, yeah. um, you don't re- generally get much surf in summer on the East coast of Australia, but we got an abundance of waves. So it was, it was kind of a win. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, you and I connected uh, over at the dynamite circle. Uh, when I had Dan on, he said, don't say DC, say Dynamite Circle because nobody okay. knows what you're talking about. So, um, And you posted this thread about the fact that you just sold your website, Home Grounds, um, which we're going to talk about here and that you're kind of jumping into personal blogging. And I love getting on the phone and getting to talk with people who've kind of gone through the entire journey of starting a business and then running it and then selling it to me is really exciting. So um, let's just kind of dive into that. I know that... Um, when I was doing a little bit of research for this, I noticed that when you got started with the website, you actually hadn't heard anything about affiliate marketing or anything like that. So where did you become interested in coffee and why start the website if you weren't planning on doing a business out of it? Yeah, that's a good question. I guess, um, if I go back to the beginning of my journey, um, I was actually a carpenter, right? So I was, I was working on the tools, mm-hmm. on building sites. And I chose that as a career at that time because I, I went to university and, and kind of studied a, um, a business degree with a cocktail of <laughs> topics because I didn't really know what I wanted to do, right? Mm-hmm. And then I remember, um, you know, buying a suit after I finished my degree, going into job interviews, and I just felt like such an imposter. And I was basically just lying and saying I really wanted this job but I didn't so that kind of led me on a path of trying something different Um, I had a lot of friends who were um, tradesmen at the time carpenters plumbers in construction and and you get paid really well in Australia to do that and it has a really good lifestyle attached to it like so what what do you mean like what what is the lifestyle the lifestyle is you start early and finish early Um, you know you don't have to sit in traffic you know Mm -hmm. i was living in sydney at the time a city so there's there's terrible traffic as with most cities um so you could basically i just saw my friends waking up um waking up early getting their work done being finished by 233 and then having the rest of the day to to do whatever they wanted that kind of lifestyle appealed to me um and i liked the idea of working with my hands so i tried that out um and it was a great three years i learned a lot but then i just came to the realization that it wasn't about the career choice it was about the job itself there was always things I wanted to do um, that I couldn't do because I had to be at work you know at 7 a.m on a Monday Um, you know I was limited you know you know you know how the story goes you're limited with your holidays etc etc so that just led me to looking at other ways um, to control you know my finances and time and it led me to making money on the internet Um, tried a couple of things that were terrible and then came across the idea of Um, building these content sites that earn money. I think the term is niche websites. Um, And the monetization method was affiliate marketing. So that led me into that industry and I was exploring and trying and uh, seeing what it was all about. And then, you know, I tried a couple of projects in that space and it went pretty well initially. You know, I was quite surprised at how well it worked. So, you know, did one project, did two projects. um, And then, uh, you know, I'm really into coffee. I always have been. And I saw that that, market you know world's most addictive drug it's quite quite popular so i thought yeah why not write about coffee or build a business around this um it wasn't really i didn't really plan ever to become some type of coffee industry entrepreneur just i kind of just fell into it by way of the path i was following um and and that's how it started and then that journey from sorry go on no, you're good. So you went into the cop, like you started home grounds as more of like a, Hey, I know that the coffee niche is, it, it seems to have opportunity there. And that's why you went into it. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's it. So what about the niche? Like if you were to kind of like look back, like what about it? Like jumped out at you? Like, was it that there wasn't any competition? Like what kind of, like, what was the indicator that told you was something that you could go into? Like you mentioned, um, you know, in that business model, one of the first things you look at is 
you look at the competition and the volume, right? You know, is there going to be enough traffic to build a business around? And it's a very SEO driven business model, right? So I'm talking, when I talk about traffic, I'm talking mostly about um, search engine traffic. Mm-hmm. So you just, you're looking at keywords, you're looking at data and looking at the traffic and then looking at the competitors for certain keywords, how, how strong they are in um, mm-hmm. an SEO sense. And then based on that intersection, you kind of move forward or you don't, you keep looking. Um, so it was a really simple process actually back then. How did you learn about SEO and how did you, cause you said that you had a few different like projects before home grounds and that those did well as well, which is like not most people's experience. Where did you learn SEO um, and like to apply to the websites? Yeah. Um, I guess pretty common um, path is just, you know, first I started searching looking online and I realized that people were using SEO to drive traffic to websites that could be monetized. And then um, I came across the, back at that time, that was 2014 ish came across a few, there's a few people in the space, um, you know, a few prolific bloggers or groups of bloggers. One of them was called um, no hat SEO, which actually turned to no hat digital. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they basically had, I think it was such a, great business model they had this um, concept where they had an internship you could do it for six weeks and they had a portfolio of websites and you could work for free for six weeks you had to put a deposit down just to show you know you're serious and you could work on their websites learning their methods which was just i was just teaching seo um, and then come out of it come out of it after six weeks you know knowing what you need to do or they they offer that as a paid course where you you know they teach you but you just work on your own websites um, and that was, I think it was $2,000 at the time. It was a big amount of money for me. It didn't have much, mm-hmm. um, but I did it. And that really just kind of like flung me into, you know, SEO and, you know, and that whole business model. Um, so I learned a lot in a short amount of time at that period. Gotcha. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, you were kind of, you know, you were working in construction and, and realized that the whole job thing didn't really like, like click. And I know that, you, you know, you started a personal blog and in the first post on that blog, at one point you say, and I'm quoting you here, um, I started the business home grounds to build wealth, which would allow me to make money and control my time. Where, like, when you think about that, where do you think that that came from? Because I feel like a lot of people have this thing. A lot of people struggle with the idea of like, I'm going to the job every day. It's the same thing, but they never really do anything about it what do you think was different about you and your situation that actually pushed you to go into uh into this direction to actually do something about it (laughs) i can think of the exact moment it's a really good question because um you know i I went to university so by the time i started working in construction i was a little bit older i think i was was 21 um and it's it's an apprenticeship model in australia probably is everywhere but Mm -hmm. you paid a very low amount hourly rate while you're learning. So for the first three years, you get paid nothing. I think I was getting paid, um, you know, like $6 an hour, six, $7 an hour, which is, you know, in, in the Australian market is terrible. Like mm-hmm. it's very, it's very small. And I remember the day where I just thought, what the hell am I doing? I was under some scaffolding in the rain. So I was getting wet. My task for that week was to clean bricks. You know, as an apprentice, you also get the terrible jobs. That's just kind of the, <laughs> the way it is. So right. I was clean. I was cleaning recycled bricks with a, you know, a chisel in the rain for six bucks an hour, just thinking to myself, is this what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? Like, I know it's going to not stay like this, but I just hated my daily existence. Like I was in pain. And I think when I look back, I think that pain was the thing that really drove me to, to start looking for other things. If I was comfortable you know, if I had a nice salary and a, and a comfortable job, I don't think I would have been driven to, to go searching. So mm. looking back, the, the pain was um, part of the process, an important part. Yeah, you know, you hear about like golden handcuffs a lot in the entrepreneur world. Like it, there's a lot of people who make a good living and they want to someday do their own business or like, you know, do whatever it is they want to do. But the pain isn't really there and where they're at is actually like pretty decent spot. And it's actually something that I've done in the past where like, I've realized that I was going through that and I've like self-sabotaged myself. Like when I was, um, when I was in college, I dropped out of school and I realized I was going into this path that was not getting me where I wanted to be. But college in the U S is like, besides the fact that you're taking on massive amounts of debt, it's pretty comfortable. Like you're not really doing anything. You know, you're basically like an old child 
And so <laughs> I dropped out because I was like, I need to figure this out. I need the pressure of actually like, you know, uh, like the pressure on myself to do that. So, uh, yeah, I know that, you know, we met in the DC and you've mentioned in, in some interviews online that a lot of the people that worked for you and that you yourself were nomadic when you were building home grounds, where did the digital nomad sort of piece in your life come from and why go and do that? Hmm. Good question. I guess it all comes back to one of my values, which is a value you'd probably share in many people uh, in this community, which is just freedom, freedom to um, control your time and, you know, wake up when you want to wake up, where you want to wake up. So that was always the driving factor. It wasn't the money and it still is a driving factor. It's just freedom. And I think the ultimate expression of freedom, especially, you know, at a certain age is just to be able to travel and experience the world. Um, you know, when, you know, I did quite a bit of travel before I started you know, working for myself and I always hated that anxiety of, you know, you go on a long, like, you know, I went on a six month European trip and just that last few weeks, just that dread knowing oh, I have to go back and go to work, like, mm-hmm. which is also the same thing I was experiencing when I was working on a Sunday, you have your weekend off and on the Sunday, you just like, oh no, I've got to start yeah. work tomorrow morning. <laughs> so I think just, just being driven by freedom, um, it was just a natural thing to do just to travel. Um, and I'm very happy I did because through that travel, I get to meet amazing people like yourself and, and members of the dynamite circle and just, just anyone else that travels generally has an interesting story. So it was always driven by, by, by freedom. I think. Did you like ever hit a point um, while you were sort of nomading, if we want to call it that, at which you kind of started feeling like it was wearing off on you? <clears throat> like it was um, like you you weren't as excited about it as you were before and it just kind of like wore, wore off as an idea the the thought of just traveling and being i guess a digital nomad mm-hmm. um yeah definitely i think like with anything in life right that what do they call it, the hedonic treadmill or hedonic adaption it's so exciting in the beginning and you know i'm so grateful for it and i, and I want to continue to do it it's amazing but then you start to miss things that you that you don't that you get when you're at home, like community and a bit of stability. So it, you know, it kind of evolved for me over the years. I, I traveled a lot when I first um, was able to. And then over the, you know, obviously I haven't been traveling this year, but like 2018, 2019, I was doing a lot of travel, but I'd always come home for a few months to a home base. And that felt like a really good mix for me personally, um, balancing the novelty and the, and the stability of home life. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, Mark Manson calls it like the diminishing return of travel. Uh, and I uh, love that. It's it's such a, A, it's such a great little quote, but also it's so true. Because like I did the same thing where when I first became nomadic, I every every two weeks it was a new place. And then there's a point at which you're like, okay, this is getting kind of old. Um, and then like yourself, you know, I really, really like this idea of like finding home bases, whether that means that it's wherever you're from, or there's like another place in the world that you really, really dig. And you're like, this is sweet. I want to come back here every year, maybe spend a couple months. So, um, I've noticed that that kind of becomes a trend with, especially entrepreneurs who are like, I can't like be super focused if I'm going in a new place every two weeks or every month or whatever. Um, Mm. I want to jump back a little bit. I know that we're kind of skipping around here on the timeline, but I'm really interested in like overlap points. So what was the overlap like when you were, and I assume that there was an overlap where you were kind of working at in construction and working on your business. What was that overlap like? And what was the point at which you were kind of like, okay, like I'm good to go. I can just jump into, you know, being my own boss now. When did that happen? Yeah, that's okay. So let's, um, the first website I started working on like seriously in 2014, um, funny enough, it was, a, it was a, it's actually funny, a work site about work boots, right? That was my first affiliate website. Um, you know, not surprising. I was working in construction. Right. I was obviously thinking about <laughs> work boots a lot, but I, I was living in Sydney working as a, um, as a, you know, carpenter and I was basically spending as much time as I could before and after work learning about the business model working on the website doing everything myself um, keep in mind I was getting paid six dollars an hour so I didn't have any money to hire I just had to grind it out um, and then 
then something happened. Then um, my girlfriend and myself at the time decided to move from Sydney. We'd, we grew up there. We just had enough. We moved to where I am now, which is um, Byron Bay. It's 10 hours north on the East Coast. It's like the, the hippie spiritual capital of Australia. It's a very beautiful place. Anyway, it's a place of lifestyle. We decided to move there. When I moved up here, I had the. I was kind of at a crossroads. Um, should I go back into construction or carpentry or should I just focus on this thing, whatever it is? I hadn't earned any money at that point. Um, and I was at a crossroads and I really didn't want to go find another job. I had a pretty good gig in the construction industry in Sydney. I was working with friends, so it was very easy. Um, and so when I came up here, I just decided, okay, I've, I've learned enough about SEO in the past six to 12 months. I'm going to try to, I'm just going to try to make it work myself. So um, I didn't go back to work. I, I had a bit of money saved up, like, you know, less than, less than $5,000. And I basically just hustled at that point to get some type of income coming in. Um, and I did a bit of, I ended up picking up a few SEO clients, to just bring some cash in while I could, while I could keep working on that affiliate website. Um, and I remember that moment, it was one of those, you know, cliche typical moments where you just got to do whatever it takes. I remember getting on the phone, you know, I'm really, I'm not, I'm kind of an introvert, right? So well, I'm definitely an introvert. Um, not really good at sales and, and pitching. So I got on my phone, I was on my balcony, I remember at the time, and I was just set, had a conversation with myself. I'm like, if you want this life, you have to get on your phone now and just cold call people that you know that have businesses and tell them that you're offering SEO services. It was so hard, but I, but I did it. I ended up picking up a few clients, which kind of bankrolled me um, for a few more months until I could start making money with the website or until I did start making money. So that was, that was another kind of crossroads for me. Um, one of those like pivotal moments, I think that was really tough at the time, but yeah, looking back, it was part of the process. What gave you the confidence to charge for your SEO services? And I think that goes hand in hand with the confidence to kind of like, like say, Hey, I think I know enough about this to like not go back to carpentry, but also the confidence to say like, Hey, I can call people up and I can actually like charge for this because I think a lot of people have skills, but they, um, maybe feel like they don't know enough to charge it. So how did you kind of like bridge that issue there about like, Hey, I do know enough about this to charge. Yeah, that's a good question. I see, um, you know, I have friends that work in the SEO industry as well and, they always underestimate what they know until they get on a phone with a client and then realize they know a lot um, mm. about, you know, about the industry. I think at that time, <laughs> to be honest, the alternative was going back to $6 an hour work cleaning bricks or something. So I, was, I had a strong motivation to, to give it a go. You know, I did feel a bit nervous at that time. I mean, I knew, I knew a lot about SEO and I knew I knew more than, mm -hmm. you know, for example, one of my clients was a mortgage broker. Um, I know he was focused on getting loans for people that wanted to invest in property. He didn't know anything about SEO. So um, I kind of took a bit of a leap at that point, knowing that I would just do my best, you know, for the clients. And if it didn't work out, I could always explain it to them, um, you know, why it didn't work out. And I learned something from the process. So it was a bit of a leap of faith at that point. Gotcha. Gotcha. I know you're a fan of Naval. Uh, I saw you've mentioned him a few times. I'm a big Naval geek as well. I'm a, I'm a recent Naval geek. Uh, I am on the, <laughs> I've gotten on the, the, the train recently. Um, but you know, one of the things that Naval really talks a lot about are like identifying leverage points. And there are these like moments where like, you know, if you put in a little bit of effort, you're going to have a lot of outcome. Or if you put in a lot of effort into it, you're going to have an even bigger outcome in home grounds in running home grounds. Can you think of a few of the big like leverage moments in that business where things like really kind of clicked, you know, um, where things change from that moment? Can you think about what those were? Yeah. Um, there's probably a few of them, but the one, the first one that comes to mind was, let me think. Um, I think, so the first thing is, um, just getting out there and meeting other entrepreneurs and going to dynamite circle events. And, you know, there's a few conferences in the SEO space, just getting out of my comfort zone and going to those things and, and kind of masterminding and meeting with people had a massive indirect effect on how I approach the business. Um, it kind of just gives you confidence that you're actually running a real business and, mm. You know, you, you kind of speak to people who are doing things that, you know, or are in places where you aspire to go and it gives you the confidence to you know, push a little bit harder. Um, 
and treating treating it more like a business. So that was one thing, like going going out and um, just networking. I know it sounds like a cliche again, but it really did have it was it was such a leverage point, like knowing people, having people to reach out to and ask questions, and then having people to kind of get motivation from. That was one leverage point. Um, another how leverage early point. On, what, how early on in like your journey would you say that you got to that point? Um, of realizing the importance of like networking. kind of joining and starting to network and that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think so really early on, I mentioned that, um, that course I did by the, by a company or a group called no hat digital. Mm -hmm. Um, they were expanding their business at the time. This is in 2014 and they invited me to fly to Mexico and help them, you know, help them run this course. Right. Cause I've just done the course. I, I did quite well. Um, and I think they were just trying to expand, right? And I was at that moment, I hadn't made a dollar online yet. Um, <laughs> so I didn't know if they knew that or not, but I just said yes at that point. And I flew to Mexico and spent six weeks with them. Um, and I was so out of my comfort zone. I remember like just being so nervous and just didn't know what I was doing. But that introduced me to a lot of people who I'm still friends with um, to this day. Um, and that was, so that was my first taste of networking. That was probably too early for me, but that, um, that helped me out a lot as well. And then I just, you know, once I was earning a bit of money and I could justify, you know, getting on a plane and going to Thailand to spend a month or so, um, then I just started doing it every year. It became kind of a, like a yearly pilgrimage um, in the SEO industry to, to go to Northern Thailand. There's a dynamite circle event there and an SEO conference. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't do, you know, I had that first experience and then I didn't do it for probably two years. And then I just started doing it more regularly and I started to see the benefit of it and just, it became a yearly thing, like a must do. What do you, what do you think those, because I, I've had a similar experience where I've taken a course um, or I've done something as part of a group and through that, I've gotten to meet the people who run it. And that has, I mean, that for me, those are some of the really big leverage points because they've uh, opened up the opportunity for like huge partnerships for me. What do you think it was, you know, you said that you hadn't earned any money yet at that point from what those people were teaching, but that they still kind of like saw you and like asked you to come help them. What do you think it was about you that they were like, hey, we want Alex to come help us out with this? It's a good question. I don't know that um, the limiting belief side of myself probably tells me they just wanted to grow their business and they were inviting anyone over. But <laughs> I think I think I just finished the course and I finished it with... Um, I remember someone telling me I was versatile that time. I was just willing to give anything a go. I was mm -hmm. working really hard. I just wanted it so badly at that point um, that I was just helping out as mm -hmm. much as possible. So I think they just, you know, they probably just saw my willingness to get get something done. And I think that goes a long way in this in this world. Like even if you don't know something, they probably knew. They probably knew. I had no idea what I was talking about. But if you can if you can just give something a go and figure it out in the way, I think that's one of the most valuable personality traits as an entrepreneur. Cause you're never going <laughs> to, you always go through something you have no idea about. And then event, you, f you figure it out on the way. I mean, yeah. in my experience, that's what I've done. I feel like too many people who are just getting started, like don't think about how they can like leverage even the few relationships maybe they have into partnerships. Like when I, I, when I kind of entered the online business world through e-commerce and I took a course to teach me how to run like an online business. And one of the things that, um, they did in that course was that like, if you bought like not the cheapest, but the like middle level course amount, you got like 10 coaching hours or something like that. And people who are listening to this may, may have heard the story before, but I kind of thought about it and I was like, okay, I'm going to spend all 10 of these hours on the one coach that I had heard somewhere on a podcast to build a relationship with them. And then I was going to pitch him to start a business together. And I did that. And he agreed because he got to know me during those coaching hours. And I think like, too few people don't like think about that when they're getting started. Cause I think that those, you know, in talking about leverage, like leverage points, like finding a way to start a partnership with someone who knows more than you or who has had way more experience than you can be like hugely game changing, you know? Sure. Definitely. Um, that's a Go ahead. I was gonna say, it's a great strategy. Um, and it's a really, really good one to keep in mind. Like just partnering with people who bring something into the table that you don't, mm -hmm. You know, everyone has to bring something, but um, powerful stuff. Along those lines, what are some other things that you think 
um, people who are just getting started with business kind of do wrong? Or have you seen people do things wrong? I honestly think when you're getting started, um, you know, it's really nice to have some type of system to follow. So let's just take a course, for example. Mm -hmm. If you can find some structured way to learn and execute, that's going to get you further, faster. And I mean, I know it all depends on finances, but try not to be cheap about it. Spend the money. Like that $2,000 I spent on that course, because I spent that $2,000 on so much money. And this is, you know, this is quite common. I had skin in the game and I had to make it work. I worked so freaking hard at it. I gave that course to, I think, a handful of friends after because I'd seen my success and none of them ever did anything with it because they just got some course, I got some videos and I probably shouldn't have shared it, but the guys won't mind. And they just never did anything with it. They didn't have any skin in the game. There wasn't an incentive for them for there to like wake up at six in the morning and just like get it done. They just, they just didn't. So find some, you know, I know there's a lot of stuff out there, but I would suggest anyone new that's starting, anyone that asked me, I say find some type of structured learning course you know obviously make sure it's a good one and then pay the money don't cheapskate and like you said as well the i always find the biggest value in the course isn't the course itself it's a community you get connected to right so mm -hmm. if you're going to go split a course with someone you want to make sure that you get access to the facebook group or whatever it is because that's where that's where all the magic happens yeah yeah absolutely yeah i think uh i've had similar experiences before where I've tried to like give people a cheat sheet. And in my opinion, it's either what you're saying, like they didn't have any skin in the game or like they didn't want it enough. Like they hadn't gone through those like pre first step steps of like really hurting. And like, they don't really have like a, like the same way that you have that experience, you know, like on that work site, you know, and it's raining and just being like, fuck this. And then like, you know, they <laughs> haven't really had that moment yet. And I think you, I think you need to go through the steps. Like you kind of need to go through the motions to get to the point where you can, you know, the course will help, so to say. Yeah. hundred percent agree. So you ran home grounds for five years um, and then decided to sell the business. Why, why come to that point? Why not? You know, it sounded like it was a pretty solid business. Like why not just kind of keep coasting on that? Why sell the business? Yeah, that's a good question. I thought about that for a long time um and so you know dan andrews from the dynamite circle has his book called before the exit thought experiments for entrepreneurs i read that a few times and he suggested you know taking some time away from the business if you're thinking about selling it just to see you know often that's all someone needs take some time mm -hmm. away come back i did that twice and i came back and i just i still wasn't excited i think i was getting complacent in the business it was you know, it was a great business. It was profitable. Um, I enjoyed growing it, but I think at the end of the day, it comes down to a gut feeling, right? I, I had some time away. I didn't, I just didn't enjoy the day to day anymore. And I was becoming complacent. You know, I wasn't really learning and pushing myself that much. Um, there was things I could have done to take that business into a different domain. Like for example, I could have added an e-commerce leg to it, which I know nothing about, but I, f I always viewed it as a stepping stone. You know, first I did those smaller niche sites. Then I did this larger authority website. And there's always, there's always was a next step for me. There's a lot of things I'm excited to try and experiment with, but that just wasn't getting me there. Um, mm -hmm. And I just kind of got stuck on that stepping stone. So after thinking about it, meditating it for a while, I just, you know, timing was also ideal. Um, I had a really good year in 2020, um, you know, kind of COVID related, but kind of because we had really strong growth. And it was just the time. Yeah, it, it was just a, it's just a gut feeling, a whole body. Yes. Do you think that like that you, you said the word complacency, do you think that that feeling had anything to do with the fact that you weren't necessarily like passionate about the topic? Because you did say that you got into, you started that website because you found that there was opportunity there. Do you think you would have had a different experience had you started, um, you know, the website, the business around the different topic that you maybe had more internal passion for? Possibly, you know, coffee, you know, coffee, I like coffee, mm -hmm. but it was, yeah, it was, as you said, it was never something I was that passionate about. I did really enjoy the industry and I enjoy the ritual of coffee, but that could have been a reason. Um, I don't, I don't quite know how to answer that question. It, it might've been, but also I think, if you're going to do anything for five years, um, I think eventually you get a little bit tired of it, but what 
that business was kind of, you know, if I compare it to a different business where, you know, you're more public, you're like, like let's just say your podcast, for example, mm-hmm. you're, you, you mentioned you, you do this partly to scratch your own itch because you want to meet cool people and you want to network and build relationships. I wasn't really getting that from the coffee website. You know, mm-hmm. I was, I, it was, it was a good business and I learned many amazing skills like building a team and building um, an audience, traffic, SEO, running a business, but there was, I wanted more from it. It wasn't, it wasn't serving me anymore. That's a thing. You know, I wanted to be involved in something that would, yeah, allow me to build more interesting relationships, become a more interesting person, um, push myself, be public. And it didn't offer those things. So that's, that's, yeah. Gotcha. That's what I think of it. What was the experience of selling the business like? Like, did you, was it pretty easy to get that sold? How did you even sell it in the first place? Like, where did you go to actually sell the website? There's a few um, brokers. Um, the most popular one that your audience probably recognizes is Empire Flippers. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's another one which I use, which is called FE International. They're just um, online business brokers, basically. I'd worked with them before. So I'd sold two smaller sites, ones I mentioned, through them. Um, I had a personal relationship you know, with the founder. So I, I just listed with them, told them I was thinking about selling it. And it was an amazing experience. They have an amazing pool of buyers and they're professionals. They know they just make the whole process easy because it is quite a complex process. Um, so the experience of the sale was great. Um, I had spent a lot of time on the business, basically setting up processes and SOPs and I built a team out. So it was very easy for the buyer to come in and just, just take over my seat and keep running the business. Um, so, you know, FE International were a great brokerage and we had really solid, simple processes to run the business. So I think those things combined meant the process went really smoothly. Mm. Can you, I know that you can't share the exact like numbers of how much you sold the business for, but for people listening, um, I think it is helpful to know like what an exit could possibly look like. Do you mind sharing anything around like, and this is again, like as comfortable or as like whatever you're allowed to share, but what sort of multiples did you get for selling it? Um, and then like, can you give us a ballpark figure of how much you sold it for? Yeah, sure. Um, it sold for low seven figures, which is <laughs> quite interesting because when I speak to people who don't know the industry and I told them I sold my coffee blog, um, they just, yeah, they think it's, <laughs> it's nothing. Right, so right, right. Um, yeah, that was the biggest milestone for me. I've never sold anything for that much. Um, so low seven figures, the multiple, to be honest, a few people have asked me that and I don't really know, you know, the way these businesses are traditionally valued, uh, a monthly net profit multiple, somewhere between you know, 25 and 40 X. Um, mm-hmm. It was it was a combination. It wasn't just like a straight up number based on the revenue because it was also, there was a few projects within the business that were starting to take off. Like we started building a YouTube channel and we had a, a pretty big growing email community. So mm-hmm. all these things factored into the multiple. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, it would have been somewhere in the 30, 33 to, to 36 X range somewhere. I don't know the exact number. Gotcha. What was that day? Like, because I mean, it, low seven figures and I, I'm sure there's money that has to go to a bunch of different places before it even gets to you. But like, that's still <laughs> a pretty nice chunk of cash to come into the bank account. What was that like? Like day one where you wake up and you're like, there's a shit ton of money in the bank. Like how did, how did you feel? Yeah, I mean, I thought about that moment, um, you know, I'm going to look at my bank account and this money's hit my account and it's probably not going to feel very real and it didn't, right? Like the, <laughs> the numbers in my bank account just went up to a huge amount and I was like, wow, okay. So that just happened. Um, right. You know, I'd anticipated that day because the process of going through the sale went for, it went for a couple of months, you know, after we agreed upon the price, there's due diligence and there was handover and everything. So I knew that figure was coming, I guess, by that point, by the time I hit my account, I was expecting it. But um, the, the probably the more impactful moment was the, was the moment when um, the buyer, like w- we accepted the offer from the buyer for that amount. That was just mm. like, oh shit, like that just happened. <laughs> it's crazy. What was that like, you know, take us to that moment. Like, how did you, like, what did you do the moment that you kind of got that deal? Because I think that that's something that a lot of people look forward to. And like, it can be an incredibly, I can imagine, intoxicating moment that's kind of like a weird way to describe it but i do feel like it must be like like how did you react to it what did you do 
<laughs> the funny thing is everyone says, you know, when you're selling a business, you should have a price, right? Like when you're negotiating, mm-hmm. you should have a price. And, you know, if you don't get your price, don't accept, blah, 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 blah. And that's, that's true. I think that's wise advice, um, you know, especially if you have a figure that, you know, something that you need the money for. But I'll be honest, that I didn't really have a price and I just pulled the number out of my ass. Like I didn't really know how to value that business. It was just a time to sell and I was going to see what people would offer for it. So the brokers were amazing at negotiating, bringing up the price. And when, yeah, basically when we agreed on that price, um, it was just a surreal feeling. I just never thought I could sell a coffee blog, you know, in the seven figure range. Um, so it, it, you know, I was <laughs> overwhelmed by gratitude um, for the journey and everything that happened. And also very excited just to know that um, the hard work paid off basically. Right. You mentioned Dan and uh, his book before the exit um, a little bit ago. And I'm curious after selling the business, after you kind of signed the paper and it's been, uh, how long has it been since you actually sold the business? Um, It was in September. I sold it for a couple months. So pretty recently still, but have you had any, not fe- not necessarily feelings of regret, but one of the things that in talking with Dan about them selling the business, it does feel like th- he he never actually said on our interviews that he regrets selling the business, but he did express multiple times things like, you know, it was it, it, like money's only so cool, you know, and then there's something like to him, he felt like there's something so much cooler about and more interesting about what they were doing, like what the business that they own meant. Have you had any sort of like feelings like that? Or do you think that the time that you spent thinking about it uh, and sort of the attempts to leave the business, take time off kind of prepared you and made you know that like that was the right choice? Yeah, I thought about it a lot. As I said, I read Dan's book twice and in the Dynamite Circle community, the forum, a lot of people spoke about this topic, you know, about selling versus not selling, exiting versus staying. And it was, it was amazing to get those um, kind of get that hindsight from people who'd been through the process. So I was, I was fully expecting that I might regret it, but Mm -hmm. I just thought about it so much. And um, as you mentioned, it was like, I want, I wanted more from my business and I do want more from business. I think, you know, business is like a way to to develop personally and to make connections in this world. And it just wasn't serving me at the at that point where I was there. It was a great business, as I mentioned, but it just, I, I just wanted something more from it. So mm-hmm. I knew that there'd be some regret over the money. Like it's really nice to have a consistent <laughs> cash flow coming into your bank account each month. Um, and I knew that like the big amount of money in my account wouldn't really change anything, right? Like I haven't, it hasn't changed anything, but well, it has changed things, but it hasn't changed anything in my immediate life. Like I didn't go and buy a nice car and like buy a house and do all this stuff. I just, you know, it's given me a lot of options now and it's given me a lot of opportunity. So I was very aware that there'd be some regret, but um, in my experience, two months on, definitely worth it. I, I would have definitely still done it. To take you back to that first blog post that you wrote on your personal site, um, which we'll link to, by the way, in the show notes if anybody wants to go check it out. But you go on to say, uh, you talk about how the first question that you'd ask yourself in the past would be, how much money can this make? And I'm quoting you here, uh, but you say that after selling the business, um, you actually think about a few other questions and that those are number one, in how many ways could this project leave me feeling fulfilled? Uh, number two, what type of impact will it have on the world? Number three, what will the day to day be like of this project? And will I enjoy doing it for five hours per day for the next five years? And finally, number four is will this project build wealth in other areas of my life, such as relationships and specific knowledge? Looking back, um, you know, the first question that you were, that you were kind of like asking yourself in the beginning was, Hey, how much money will this make? Do you think it's valuable for people who are just getting started to consider those other four questions that you now ask yourself (laughs) in launching their first business? Or do you think it's better for them to kind of, Hey, these are, would be nice to haves, but the most important thing for me to figure out right now is like the money side of it. And the rest of that stuff doesn't really matter at the moment. What do you think about that? It's a difficult question to answer, but 
I guess, yeah, you know, I thought about recently, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and we have like an entrepreneur hierarchy of needs. And the reason I asked that question in the beginning was because I just needed to make some money so then I could breathe and, and think about what else I wanted to do, which is, which is where I'm at now. So I think if you're just starting, it's not a bad thing to ask that question first. You just have to realize that it's probably not going to lead to fulfillment. And again, you hear so many people say this, but it's not about the money. When you start a business, you're going to be spending a lot of your time in that business every day, multiple hours per day, most probably for you know five years. Um, and that five hours a day, five years things comes from Dynamite Circle as well. It's one of their thought exercises. So it's a good idea. Think about the money, right? Of course, you need to make money, but also think about what is a day-to-day going to be like? Am I going to enjoy doing this all day? Because that is going to be the reality of your life for the next few years and you have to enjoy it mm-hmm. <laughs> because you know, it's just, it's your life. So um, not a bad thing to ask about the money first and where I'm at now, I guess this is just like the evolution of my journey. Now I'm looking for different things. I, of course I still want the business to make money. It has to make money to work, but there's, there's other things I want from it. So I'm going to ask, will it make money? But I'm also going to ask a few other questions. The ones you mentioned, I'm going to ask those first. And if it if if it's a good answer for those questions, then I'll ask, will it make money? If, it, if it's no, it won't make money. I'm not in a position to still do it. I still have to make money. Um, so it's just about the order in which you ask those questions for yourself. Yeah, it kind of goes back to you know Tim Ferriss's kind of muse idea. Is like you built a muse for yourself to kind of answer those like really necessary things that you need to have like hey i need money to eat and like live and stuff like that but then like once you do have the muse there it affords you the ability to think a little bit higher up on that hierarchy so um totally makes sense what kind of you know along those four questions you did start a personal blog but what is uh what else do you have in the workings right now what are some of the things that you're going to be working on in the future and if the only thing that you're working on is the blog what is kind of the plan and the trajectory for that yeah so i guess i'm in that space now um the thing I'm trying to avoid the most is just being busy for the sake of being busy because as an entrepreneur, you probably realize that like you just always want to get shit done and sometimes you need the space. Like, uh, you know, giving my, so I'm giving myself a space now to really think about what that next project is um, and some of those questions that we just spoke about are, are kind of the criteria basically for the next project. The personal blog, um, <laughs> it's very new. My first post is terrible. I wrote it for myself. Everyone's obviously free to, to check it out and I will put some stuff about what I learned. I thought it was great. My, so Thank you. I appreciate that. But yeah, I'm going to write some stuff about um, what I learned from doing you know, home grounds for five years, what I would have done differently, which I think um, will be helpful for anyone looking at that business model. But the reason I'm doing that personal blog right now is because I'm exploring the concept, which Naval talks about a lot of like productizing yourself. Mm-hmm. I don't really know if it's different from the idea of creating a personal monopoly. I keep hearing these terms thrown around a lot right now um, and I'm looking into it a lot. But for me, what it means is just building a platform of opportunity. So by writing and creating a personal blog, um, it's not, I'm not expecting this to be the next thing, but it will probably lead to the next thing as I, as I write because writing helps you think and it helps you connect with other people and it helps you really go deep on a topic and kind of, uncover insights that maybe aren't available to anyone who's just not anyone that's not going deep on it. So it's kind of my, um, it's kind of my, my medium right now for uncovering the next thing. Um, Mm -hmm. I know this is another thing I learned from exploring this topic um, on like productizing yourself or blogging. Um, It's really, it's really easy to get caught in this loop of like, what's my niche? What should I do? And maybe some people know that some people obviously know that already and they just have an idea and they go for it. But I think a lot of people, especially starting, get really hung up on like, well, what should I choose? Um, and from, you know, I've been spending a lot of time on Twitter, reading people, they're talk, reading people's threads about this. And what I've gathered is that you don't, you know, in the space that I'm in, you don't, some people might choose their niche, but you can just put a lot of stuff out there and something will arise through that process. So by being creative and putting stuff out there, um, something will come up and when it does, I'll be in a position to go for it. But until that day comes, I've just got to kind of express myself through writing. I'll try to at least. Yeah, I've had a similar experience with this podcast. Is This is actually the first thing that I have like really stayed consistent with every single week 
for like two years. You know what I mean? And even though this podcast doesn't have like it, I mean, we're not getting thousands and thousands of downloads here or anything like that, but just the fact that it's there and the consistency is there has already, you know, opened doors that I would have never had before. And so for me, mm. like that has been a huge, like, like proof, even though people say it online, all of a sudden I have this personal proof of like, Hey, just do it. And like, it will open doors that wouldn't have been there before. And like you said, you know, like the op, like when, the coronavirus hit and everyone started being interested in remote work. I'd already had the podcast and I was already in like the perfect position. So I, I totally agree with you. I, I think it's a great move to do that. And do you think I'm, I'm kind of curious, do you wish that you had started the personal blog while, you know, like a few years ago while you're still running home grounds or are you glad that you waited and to have sold the business? I think I, yeah. In hindsight, it would have been a good idea to start it while I was going through some of these experiments with the, you know, with the business and I would have had a lot of stuff for case studies, even though I can still write about that stuff, it would have been a lot more um, fresh and relevant. So yeah, I would, I, in hindsight, I would have started it back then. Um, it was, I guess I was just learning to juggle priorities and time management and stuff. So I never did. You know? Gotcha. Well, Alex, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, man. This has been uh an awesome conversation. And, and I think people really got to learn a lot. If uh, people are interested in kind of uh, in reading the blog or, you know, you know, following you on social media, where can they uh, find you online? My blog, as I said, it's very new, but they can, there'll be some new posts on it soon. So it's alexazuri.com. Um, I've also got oh, seven followers on Twitter. So if you want to follow me on Twitter and be number eight, nine, 10, it's just Alex underscore Azuri, A-Z-O-U-R-Y. Um, I'll be planning to post a lot more um, and put a lot more stuff out there over the next few months as I kind of go through this journey. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you awesome. so much, Miko. It was great to connect and catch up with you. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. I'm going to have uh, links to all of that. So uh, if you're listening, you can write that down. Don't worry about it. Just head on over to uh, the show notes and you'll have that. Alex, seriously, thank you so much and uh, all the best, brother.